Reactor number four at the Chernobyl Atomic Energy Station exploded. And one mother came up to me and said, can you give me an injection to help ease my child's death? I saw a, uh, empty, empty hospitals without any kind of uh, supplies or without any kind of uh, technology to speak of. It was, everything is so antiquated. Uh, my assessment was it was approximately 50 to 70 years behind the Western uh, times, Western uh, uh, technology, and therefore I was uh, very uh, upset about that. Well, we told them, uh, the, the parents that we met in the, in the uh, units, says, we definitely will be back. I don't know with what, but we definitely will come back, and our promise holds. So when we got back the next following day, I called all my friends in the auxiliary, which is the medical auxiliary. I said, guys, whatever you have in your husband's offices, I want it. The organization has now completed 30 airlifts and 14 sea shipments, bringing in more than $50 million worth of aid to hospitals in 14 provinces. Tragically, there are 4,000 hospitals in Ukraine, and the vast majority of them are so woefully equipped that you and I probably have uh, more medicine in our, in our kitchen cabinet than some of these hospitals have to work with. By giving aid to Ukrainian hospitals, the organization is following a simple plan, and that's to help the youngest victims of the Chernobyl disaster, the children. The children are particularly vulnerable to radioactive exposure because their bodies are growing at the fastest rate um, they tend to be very vulnerable to particular types of radioactive uh, substances like radioactive iodine. Um, in this part of the world, a lot of children were stricken with thyroid cancer because they uh, did not have a lot of naturally occurring iodide uh, in their diet. An environment filled with radioactive iodine, cesium and strontium is one of the long-term results of Chernobyl. Possibly the largest environmental issue on Earth um, could be figuring out how to solve Chernobyl, at least in, in our day and age. Uh, I think it's an important issue to, to bring up. Olenka Welesh is an American researcher in Ukraine examining the effect of radiation on soil, plants, animals, and ultimately humans. One of the things I do is collect soil and then hay uh, and then milk from a specific region that's contaminated to see what the transfer rate is. Radioactive particles move from the soil to a plant or animal at different rates. The fewer the minerals in the soil, the higher the transfer rate. The regions most contaminated by Chernobyl have very poor soil, which increases the transfer factor and makes the food supply more dangerous. So the radioactive particles that have fallen on most of the soil in Ukraine is an issue because it's a largely agricultural country. Most people, as we see here, um, survive solely off of their own gardens and because they just make too little money in order to buy their food. They believe that 95 percent of the ionizing radiation that's affecting people today, 17 years after Chernobyl, comes from the food that they're consuming. Not from the water, not from the air, it's coming from the food. What people can do on a personal basis is be informed. Uh, what's most important is for people to know what kind of food to eat and what kind of food not to eat. In Polisia, where there are so many forests, one of the most popular habits is to go mushroom picking and berry picking. And they actually happen to concentrate a lot of the radioactive isotopes. By comparing radiation transfer rates with local Ukrainian diets, Olenka has prepared a pamphlet with information for nearby residents on how to identify safer ways to eat and remain healthy. Even though there isn't enough conducive research right now to prove scientifically what the effects are, we've seen the proof in the hospitals of Ukraine. In the process of her research, she's also helping provide critical information to the Ukrainian authorities about radioactivity at the local level and what needs to be done. I'd like to see somebody drop $10 million and we can solve this problem like that. Academy of Sciences professors that I've worked with have done unbelievable research and they have all the solutions in their heads, in their hearts, on paper, but they have no money at all to implement them. And it must be such a frustrating position because they exist 
to do better for their people, and, and, and there isn't a way yet. Back in Viv, Dr. Roman Kowalski is all too aware of the effect radiation has on children. He's a specialist in cardiac birth defects. In the 15 years since Chernobyl, we've seen a very big increase in the number of cardiac birth defects. Some of these defects we cannot combat, but many of them are either preventable or they can be corrected. And our goal is to correct those birth defects that are still treatable. But thanks to donations and support from America, Dr. Kowalski is finding his job to be a little bit easier. Recently, a shipment of much needed equipment arrived just in time. Behind me is a child on a neonatal ventilator. Until recently, such a child would have died because we simply couldn't afford the necessary machinery to keep him alive. Dr. Kowalski always had a great aspiration to provide his patients with world-class care. And we brought him for training in the United States, and now he's trying to implement all of the skills and knowledge that he picked up in the United States. Unfortunately, in Ukraine, birth defects aren't limited to the heart. What affects me the most is the uh, unbelievable number of children that are born with all kinds of defects, signs of uh, with one hand or arm or web uh, fingers, web uh, toes. Deformed organs and premature births plague the entire region. 150 miles to the north of Viv lies the city of Lutsk. Here, Dr. Mikala Nativ is a specialist in infant survival at the Volin Regional Children's Hospital. This is a very premature baby, born just nine days ago. He was born after only 26 weeks of gestation. The baby was born to parents who live in a contaminated village near Chernobyl. Like most hospitals in the area, his was once short of some of the most basic medical technology. In the early years here in Lutsk, there was often one incubator or respirator for five desperately needy children, and we were tired of seeing uh, the doctors have to make this King Solomon decision of which child lives and dies. Thanks to the efforts of the outside world, all that has finally changed. This monitor shows the saturation of oxygen in the blood, and this one monitors the child's heart rate. The hospital is now home to a new ambulance, transport incubator, and an advanced neonatal intensive care unit. They are, in fact, the only ones around for hundreds of miles. Before we had this equipment, one in every five children died here, but now fewer than eight in 100 will die. The hospital here in Lutsk has been really one of our dreams come true. They started with nothing. We brought them a little bit of aid in the early years. They worked with it, leveraged it, and then we built on that initial success to the point where they now have a very fine neonatal intensive care unit and they've dropped their infant mortality rate threefold. Every day this child stays alive, its chances of survival get better and better. And of course, that's what we're after. One of those survivors today lives in America, but it almost didn't happen. Vova Malafienko was a child when the Chernobyl disaster struck. It happened when I was two years old in 1986. And at that point, the government didn't really tell us what happened. They just said it was like a small explosion or whatever. It didn't really, there was no, nothing to worry about. And Later, Vova was diagnosed with an especially aggressive form of acute leukemia. And only rudimentary treatment was available in Ukraine. The doctor told us, based on the blood test that they took that I had leukemia and at that point my parents didn't really know what leukemia was and they just they I mean they were very upset because they found it was cancer and it was possibly life-threatening as soon as we started the treatment like my hair started falling out every day I wake up and there's more and more of my hair on the pillow fortunately Vova was one in a group of eight children who traveled to America thanks to the children of Chernobyl relief fund Bobo was only five years old when he came to this country and I think there was something about his love of life and his 
um, cherubic demeanor that endeared him to everybody that, that he met. Once here, he received the treatment he needed and his leukemia went into remission. Unfortunately, all the other seven children had to go back. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I think they're all dead now because they returned. None of them survived their cancer. It's certain that Volvo would not have survived without the treatment he uh, was able to benefit from here in the United States. And now, 10 years later, Vova is a living example of what can be accomplished if sick children are given the support they need. Now I'm going to college. I have classes pretty much every single day. Uh, I think my favorite subject at this point is sociology. But in general, my main like, topic of study is business management. That's what I wanted to become in general. Today, for every success story like Vova, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of children who are getting the help they need in Ukraine. We realized at a very early stage that for every child that we could bring here to the United States to provide treatment, we could probably provide technology and training in Ukraine that could save the lives of 20, 40, 50 children for that same investment um, into, of resources and finances. Every possible type of equipment or funding that they can get to buy new equipment is just, it, it can help save hundreds or thousands of kids because uh, the doctors there are amazing. They're some of the best doctors in the world, and the nurses, but they just, even they can't treat you if they don't have the proper technology and medicine to do it. With millions of dollars in relief already supplied, dramatic improvements have already been made. But more work lies ahead. We know that there's no question that Chernobyl's had a very significant impact. I think it may be hundreds of thousands of years because of the, uh, there may be a permanent damage uh, done to the uh, genetics of uh, certain people who were uh, you know, affected by radiation. It's hard to see sick children, but it's my job. It's my job. Medicine and money does help because if, if this can happen to me, it can happen to anybody with the right proper medication. An explosion like Chernobyl could happen anywhere. And if we have a living example of how to repair it, how to continue living with, with minimal side effects, with minimal negative effects, then it, it can only be advantageous for all of humanity. I would like to see that the people of Ukraine, the government of Ukraine, the entire medical system of Ukraine, and all of the uh, uh, countries of the, uh, of the Western world to help the children of Ukraine to make them better because I think they deserve the help. There's no doubt in our mind that, that CSERF has had an impact, that there are children alive today because of the generosity of thousands of people here in the United States that reached out halfway across the world to make a difference in a child's life. We have children who are already six years old who come to us and bring me flowers and say thank you. Now that's, that's the best By concentrating on physician training and expanding its campaign to combat infant mortality, the Children of Chernobyl Relief Fund is playing a key role in helping hundreds of children overcome thyroid cancer, leukemia, birth defects, and other life-threatening diseases. And in doing so, they describe a vision of the future where children everywhere have access to a simple dream, a healthy, happy, and long life. For more information about Voices of Vision or the organization profile, visit our website at www.voicesofvision.org.